Okay, so Ralph and Papati uh, from Arizona State. So, oh, by the way, I should have mentioned everybody's bio is in the, the, the folder so you can read all about him uh, in your folder. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, sorry, I had to. I wanted to stand up because I am coming from the West Coast, and it's you guys just changed the time again. So we are like three hours behind you. So we in Arizona try to stay consistent, and the rest of the world keeps changing anyway. Um, so I am. I just didn't want to. I didn't want to fall asleep while talking. Um, so anyway, so I am trying to go uh, give you uh, like a quick uh, overview of uh, uh, what's going on in AI and, and, and especially how it is, what would be the consequences uh, for security, both cyber security and security of AI systems themselves. Um, so uh, I don't know how many of you know JBS Haldan, who is a, um, a eminent biologist and who once said, the universe is not only clearer than we suppose, but clearer than we can suppose. Um, so I think of this and I think of AI because AI apparently is slightly bigger than you suppose, probably bigger than you can suppose. Um, it's been uh, likened to electricity. It's been likened to bigger than fire and electricity. AI of course is God itself. Everybody is falling over each other to add AI to everything. This is the electronic toothbrush that apparently improves your teeth cleaning. I'm really worried about that. Uh, so there is a humongous amount of uh, positive uh, stuff, uh, hype about this. There's also a whole bunch of negative hype about it. Uh, AI is a bigger threat than North Korea and AI will start the third world war. Elon Musk really has a lot of time um, in between the <laughs> manufacturing problems. Uh, AI could be the worst event in the history of simulation. <laughs> Stephen Hawking said that and AI is likely to destroy humans anyway. Uh, that's what Alan Musk said. Uh, so now, of course, the academia are supposed to be the more careful ones. Uh, and, and so not surprisingly, MIT plans to start a college for AI. Uh, you know, if you have a billion dollars, you would like to do that. Uh, Carnegie Mellon wants to start an undergraduate degree in AI. Uh, China unveils a high school AI textbook. India is doing a middle school textbook on AI. Uh, <laughs> now, really, as all of you can see, this is you know not enough, really, because I've seen you know my, me and my colleagues at Arizona State University have figured out that this is just too little, too late. And so, starting this fall, we are starting the first ever in vitro AI course. Uh, so. Please, and you know, enroll all your uh, soon-to-be-born people, uh, kids, into this course. Anyway, so I mean, obviously, there is uh, no end to the hype. Um, the advantage of one advantage of the hype, of course, is that people like us in uh, AI get to be on the TV shows, get to be on the other TV shows, the uh, White House, and also, of course, get and uh, see Uncle. Um, Einstein. Um, so we are all apparently experts on what's going on in the world. So my agenda for today is actually just three parts. What just happened? Um, and uh, I want to, and, and as surprising as it might seem, AI actually is one of the few fields which had a specific meeting where the field got christened. That was in 1956. And so it's been around for quite a while, actually. Um, not as old as math and physics, but you know, as a, as a field, it's been around. And so if you uh, woke up just recently, you would think as if the whole thing just happened recently. Uh, and I want to give you a kind of a perspective on what changed. Um, and then also, are we done? Uh, uh, in particular, the kinds of uh, significant thresholds that are still left. And then finally, uh, implications of AI for the cybersecurity. Here, there is actually a two-edged sword. AI techniques can help cybersecurity. There are people here, very impressive people, who have done some work um, in using AI techniques to improve cybersecurity. Um, but also, AI opens up a whole entire set of new attack surfaces. So it's like, as you are trying to help with the existing problems, you're also trying to open up a whole entire slew of new problems. And so this is a very interesting issue, where again, of course, there may be AI techniques can come uh, into play and help. Uh, so it's, it's sort of a sort of a friend and enemy, uh, frenemy approach uh, to cybersecurity and AI, I guess, 
So, uh, what's AI? Uh, so, informally, it's basically getting machines to do things that when done by humans would be considered intelligent behavior. That's this beautiful circular definition. Um, the, in intro to AI textbooks and in the classes, we talk about uh, developing an intelligent agent architecture, uh, which essentially interacts with the environment, has and then, then tries to do um, intelligent, tries to show intelligent behavior. Um, so now I don't want to get into the technical details on this, but I find uh, that it's quite useful to have this one perspective that of course there are multiple different kinds of intelligences and when kids come into this world, um, and those of you have seen kids and you're probably yourself one, uh, we actually start being showing perceptual and manipulation intelligence. We look at the world, we can recognize the mom's face, kids who can't recognize their mom's face tend to get a rather raw deal. Um, and then uh, they will start doing manipulation, putting everything into their uh, uh, mouths. And uh, one of the interesting things that to keep in mind is much of this is largely tacit and subconscious. They do it, you don't really know how they do it. They don't know how they do it. Um, then they start showing emotional intelligence, um, when to cry, when not to, when to smile. Um, and then of course, social and communicative intelligence, that's where your language sort of things also develop. It also requires a theory of mind, realizing that the other person is a person and that they have a, a mind of their own. And then start finally showing uh, glimpses of cognitive and reasoning intelligence. This is the kind of things that we test in SATs. And of course, this is the part of our intelligence that is in some sense a declarative and more consciously accessible. This is what civilization has all been all about. This is the stuff for which we wrote books, right? Keep that in mind. The last time around we were having these kinds of, um, um, you know, workshops and having uh, people from AI come over and to pontificate was around in the 80s when there were expert systems, <laughs> which were these rule-based systems uh, that were essentially capturing the knowledge um, and, and the standard operating procedures and the know-how of various companies. And that was a big industry at that particular point of time. Uh, in 90s, you had um, reasoning systems like Deep Blue, which actually dethroned Kasparov um, and of course, you know, ended the uh, human dominance of chess. Um, and then of course, only recently, 2000s, and in fact, late, um, you know, 2006 onwards, we started making pretty impressive breakthroughs um, in uh, perceptual tasks. Uh, computer vision as an area existed for quite a long time, but it's now become sort of a subroutine uh, for uh, uh, this machine learning that we'll be talking about in a minute. Um, so perceptual tasks, speech recognition has become commonplace, image recognition has improved quite significantly, and then we are doing a lot more steps towards a language. Now it's useful to look at this and notice that in fact AI system, while the human babies show perceptual, then emotional, then social, and then cognitive, AI systems went from cognitive first to perceptual later. And you know, the jury is still kind of out on emotional and social intelligence, actually. Um, it's a useful, this reverse dif development of AI is a very useful um, thing to understand because I believe that it explains a whole lot of things um, about both um, why in fact AI developed this way and also why you get all these uh, misconceptions in public about AI. This is a kind of a dense slide. Let me try to unpack it for you. So why did AI develop this reverse way? It's easier to program computers and aspects of intelligence for which you have conscious theories. You started essentially by programming computers. And, and so there is this Polanyi's paradox which says that essentially we know more than we can tell or we can articulate. But then there is also a whole bunch that we can articulate and the ones that we articulated are the ones that we were able to automate originally. Uh, so the progress in reasoning and cognitive intelligence happened much before perception. We are not particularly conscious at all of perceptual and manipulation intelligence. We all know how to look at people's faces and figure out who we are talking to. But if you ask me to explain why do you think this is Fred, I have no idea how to explain other than, you know, sort of hand waving. And similarly, if you ask me to explain exactly how are you going to hold this glass, again, it's not very clear how to explain. It's just, I know how to do it. So this is sort of tacit knowledge. And so nobody can teach you this. You just have to learn it more or less from scratch. And so we have to depend on making the machines learn this stuff the same way we do. I don't know, again, if you have had kids, 
and seeing kids, they basically just hang around doing nothing for long stretches of time, years on, just being cute and all, and trying to basically you know keep eating foods that you've supplied to them while they're essentially absorbing the world, right? So now I if you try to have a machine which tries to do that, you know, machines are somehow not cute enough, and so we don't like that. So in general, kids actually learn you know, many of these kinds of things, uh, like the perceptual intelligence, they basically learn um, by observation, and we had to do that for the machines too, and that's essentially where the latest interest, uh, the, the big uh, changes in perceptual intelligence came. By the way, I don't know if people notice that in fact, this is where the web entered. You know that this is the 30th anniversary of World Wide Web, and what happened in World Wide Web is it allowed, you know, there's um, um, the Carl Jung basically said the collective subconscious. We all have the subconscious. And what we did was we uploaded our subconscious onto the web. So because of which there's tons and tons of data. I mean, people, some, some of the people here are old enough to remember in computer vision, there used to be one picture called Lena picture. Uh, which was an ex-playboy model, and then she they would use that feature to basically evaluate their algorithms most of the time. And now, of course, we have billions and trillions of billions of pictures, mostly because everybody has um, these um, the, the cell phones, and we have web, and we can upload everything. It's not that we were not producing data before; we were not capturing it. And if you don't capture it, we can't use it. And that is something that wound up being a big difference. Um, in fact. There was technologies ready and waiting to be exploited, but we just did not have um, the data available before because we were not capturing them. And these ad additional uh, orthogonal developments in human societies uh, actually wound up helping uh, with this. So now the second part is, why did AI catch public imagination now? Uh, obviously, when uh, early AI is sort of a blind and deaf Socrates. Okay, imagine having a, a little kid um, who basically can pontificate on philosophy but can't recognize your face, doesn't do all the cute things like smiling, etc. Kind of hard for those kids to survive the world, even though obviously there is PhDs in philosophy to be given later on. Um, but AI is basically was a blind deaf Socrates when you had um, Deep Blue winning over um, uh, Kasparov, it, you, you kind of had some fun for a couple of minutes. After that, it didn't really affect your life day and out, okay? But now, perceptual abilities have allowed AI to come to all of us, in particular on our cell phones, on our Alexas, on our Teslas, on our everything. Uh, essentially, we are sort of view, uh, uh, basically getting some of the fruits of the AI technology. So then, essentially, people hear about it. It becomes a household name, and it also, means that people now suddenly see AI everywhere, which also leads to all sorts of misrepresentations and misperceptions because people, everybody actually thinks they are an expert. I mean, my, one of my interesting uh, observations to myself is that the market for AI experts who haven't ever taken an AI course has never been greater. So, <laughs> right? um, so then there is also this other issue, which is there is our romance with tacit knowledge and wordless communication. If anybody, if you have a significant author and the significant other asks you, why do you like me? Please don't write one, reason one, reason two, reason three, reason four. That way your relationship will not go anywhere. You are supposed to say, I like you because of your essential you-ness, okay? We sort of romanticize the inability to explain things. We romanticize tacit knowledge. We like things to be just learned without us having to tell that. And this stuff actually winds up biting us as we'll see in a minute. So this is another reason why people love, you know, learning based approaches because I don't have to say anything and somehow you're going to learn. Of course, sometimes you learn something completely different from what I wanted you to learn and then we get into trouble. So it's a useful thing to remember. In fact, uh, there was this old saying by Marvin Minsky, who's one of the founders of AI, um, that he said, with understanding comes a sense of loss. And there used to be this old problem that AI systems, the moment they start working, people say, well, oh, this is how you're supposed to do this task. I don't understand it. If you go by that, as we'll see in the rest of the slides, on the perceptual intelligence, 
there is no sense of loss at all because we know that these systems are working but we don't yet completely understand why they work and it's not surprising because we don't understand how we do perception we have no theories okay so this is my obligatory neural network slide which is the deep learning is the reason um, you know for many of these advances that you know that you keep hearing about and the, the point to keep in mind is that the current work has basically these neural networks have been around since 60s you know perceptrons were there you know in 60s and this is like the third coming of neural networks there was a the 80s there was another coming and then now it's a this time they actually stuck. Um, the basic technology existed for decades and was all but given up for dead. You know, there's a reason why there are only like three or four people whose names are associated with deep learning because everybody else thought this is not going to go anywhere and so they were working on something else. Okay. Now, and what happened inst interestingly is that the advances in communication and data capture infrastructure, which has nothing really to do with AI, wound up being very helpful in bringing these technologies back into fold. So in fact, as much as we would love to believe that there was some specific theoretical advance that suddenly made neural networks burst forth, that was not what happened. What really happened was the availability of data and availability of you know, computational power, um, which has, you know, which sort of occurred orthogonally to um, AI. And you know, this kind of cuts are uh, rebranded as deep learning. Now, there are some impressive feats in the perceptual um, intelligence that you I'm sure have heard of, but I'll show you a couple of them. We can now do, uh, you know, look at pictures, machines can look at pictures like this and provide captions, pretty impressive. You know, the kinds of things that we, I understand that you barely get a job for doing this, uh, but we never expected computers to be able to do it. And then that's something that we are able to do. Um, just like you can dream up people's faces, you can have machines dream up people's faces. <coughs> So this one is actually a, a website called thispersondoesnotexist.com and you can essentially uh, keep, you know, recycling, refreshing that web page and it will keep giving you more and more faces that don't take off, that don't correspond to any actual real world person. Um, again, you don't know exactly how to check this. All they are saying essentially is that in their training data set, there was no exact person like this. So there are all these people apparently they don't exist. Um, so, and then a couple of weeks back, actually, um, so we can do language modeling, we can develop text, we can write down text, you know, uh, like SAT, essays kinds of things, um, which basically just happen automatically. So this one is an uh, OpenAI GPT-2 system, which takes a, um, a, a, an essay prompt saying recycling is good for the world and writes a pretty coherent essay uh, that would make um, uh, some uh, deep uh, right conservatives very happy about how in fact recycling is bad for the earth and there's nothing wrong with this essay in fact it looks like reasonable English and so it's kind of interesting to look at that and of course we also have started making some progress in perception to action uh, you know the kind of thing that you heard about in AlphaGo um, uh, and the various other board games. Okay, so a couple of things I want to mention before we go off because this might sort of make a baseline as we have these discussions in the next one and a half days is there's some un unintuitive aspects of deep learning. This is at the level of intro to AI, you know, um, one of which is of course, as I mentioned, we are now in this look my works kind of a wondrous space. There's so many things that are working and our ability to explain is still coming slowly. It's not surprising because we were building bridges before we knew strength of materials. And that's the phase we are, you know, we are going through in the perceptual intelligence in AI right now. Uh, state of the art, one thing that's pretty obvious to the people in AI here, and, but may not be uh, as obvious to some other people, is that the state of the art networks may have more parameters, more tunable weights than the amount of data they're training themselves on. So the GP2 system that I showed you, the one that developed the text, it has 1.5 tunable weight, 1.5 billion tunable weights, 1.5 billion tunable weights, keep that in mind. And it basically trained itself on some 8 million web pages. Um, this is kind of, and the, all these weights are essentially being tuned by the same work hours, which is the back propagation, which is kind of surprising, kind of hard to sort of wrap your mind around it. I kind of think that, think of the barrier reef, and if somebody were to tell you that barrier reef was formed by the poop of this little sea 
organisms, it will be extremely hard to believe. You can wait around for a while and nothing happens. But in deep time, you have variety. And our intuitions about deep time were pretty bad. That's why we keep thinking there, is this, there must be a watchmaker because there's a watch. And we also have pretty bad intuitions about zillion epochs. The deep time essentially is being speeded up when you're doing backpropagation on these 1.5 billion um, you know, parameter networks because of the computational power. You can do many, many, many small uh, updates of waves. And, and so it's not obvious to you that this actually would work. And you know, it's something that you should have a, a sense of. The second is, is anybody uh, who has any sense of statistics should know that 1.5 billion parameters, this is like the, the full, full on overfitting. You know, this must be a nightmare scenario for overfitting. You know, most of the time when you took statistics courses, you would have thought this is a humongous amount of data and you're trying to tune maybe seven weights. Here you have 8 million pages and you're trying to tune 1.5 billion weights. Now, the interesting question is why doesn't overfitting occur? It's not clear. And in fact, it's not even clear that overfitting does not occur. I will try to show that in fact, um, the kind of, so the overfitting, for those of you who may not have thought about, you know, if you have a bunch of points like this, right, you might be thinking that you have a, like a, a line. You know, if you're trying to do a, um, a, a least squares uh, fitting of a line, you might get a line like this. But if I say you have, like you can fit this uh, with a, a 1500 degree polynomial then the 1500 degree polynomial might agree with you in all your training data and do crazy stuff when you are not looking. Real crazy stuff when you are not looking. And you will see in a minute that the current deep networks can be made to do real crazy stuff. Those are the adversarial examples. And it's not surprising because we have tons and tons of uh, freedom, you know, degrees of freedom. And that can be used for good as well. Okay, so the unintuitive failure modes is this one that I was talking about. So obviously, um, this is your school bus and this is your puppy. I hope I don't have to teach you how to recognize this. But then as uh, you know, if you add some noise, uh, some fraction of this noise, then you get these two pictures. Most of you probably realize that they are ostriches, right? <laughs> It turns out that they can be many systems, many uh, perceptual syst uh, uh, systems that are state of the art can be made to think that this is an ostrich, this is an ostrich. Okay, now that's interesting. It is possible that unbeknownst to you, the world is full of ostriches. Okay, you never know. It's also true that we should not be too happy about our own perceptual intelligence. Okay, I don't know how many of you have seen this picture and if you can look at that there, you can see it better. This is a picture that was making rounds in Norway a couple of years back by some uh, right-wing uh, nuts who said, oh my God, Norway is being taken over by these burqa clad Muslim women, you know, and so we need to stop this stuff. By the way, Norway is our favorite immigration country, if you remember. Um, so the question, of course, is when you look at this, you might realize that, yeah, I know that those are bozos, but I know why they fell for this. These are, after all, normal city bus seats. At a certain angle, they look like burqa clad Muslim women. So you kind of can see the failure. Now, can you see, now that I told you that story, can you see why is in a certain angle this looks like an ostrich? How about this? This is the thing that you want to keep in mind. The failure modes, when you, you're happy when the network agrees with you on the, 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 on the, on the labels that you agreed with, but when it fails, when, you can, when it fails, you don't necessarily have a sense of why it actually failed. Okay, and in this particular case, of course, this was a deliberately manufactured example, and these adversarial examples is something that we will talk about a lot during the next one and a half days, because these are huge security threats. Um, so that what's happening really is that all this extra uh, freedom that you have, you can use that to make this car say something completely different from what the actual class is supposed to be. Interestingly enough, the theory for reading us do this is doing the same back propagation, except now you back propagate on the pixel values rather than on the weights. You keep the weights same and then back propagate on the pixel values. But there are many different ways of doing these adversarial examples. Um, and you know, in fact, 
a, a, a great thing to say about the community is that the deep learning community, uh, uh, some of who are here, like Nicholas, for example, um, have actually been very active in trying to show how to, you know, break the system. This is how science goes. You don't hope for somebody else to find out how your system breaks. Okay, um, so one of the reasons why you get surprised to many of these things is actually this example closure tendencies people have. In, for example, people should think when you have a network that sort of shows, you know, various uh, uh, animals can be recognized, you tend to think that there's some sort of convex regions, you know, where, you know, this is the chimp, this is the given, this is the panda, and so on. But what might be happening could be something like this. In this high dimensional place, space, there might be small slithers which correspond to specific classes with close to 99% of this high dimensional space not really having any certainty about what the class is. And so it is actually possible that you could do these kinds of crazy adversarial examples. When they started coming out, adversarial examples were sort of like a boutique idea, but now people realize, in fact, as, as I was saying, that this is sort of a fundamental issue to some extent. So that's like Jeff Hinton saying, no, I don't think this is going away right away. He was actually hoping that it will go away right away. Um, so that sort of gives you some idea about what just happened and uh, what are the things in terms of perceptual intelligence that you want to keep in mind. The next thing that I want to talk a little about is are we done? And in doing this, actually, of course, we are not done. Uh, there are a whole bunch of things that we still haven't have figured out. Um, there are uh, some of these, uh, I wrote down here, combining tacit and explicit knowledge. Remember, I talked about the fact that AI developed with explicit knowledge first, and then we started doing tacit knowledge now. But really, we humans are very good at combining explicit and tacit knowledge. And this is something that we haven't yet figured out how to do well in AI, and I want to talk a little bit about that. Of course, everybody talks about common sense, we talk about that too, and then uh, I'll talk about a couple of other things like interaction with humans. Uh, but let me do this first one. Um, it's not surprising that there's irrational exuberance. Once you have perceptual intelligence working, as I told you, there's just so many applications that can that it can be used for. And so there's a lot of a land rush mentality in the industry to exploit AI technology before the competitors do so. Uh, so much so that there was a recent study, like less than a week back, that 40% of the AI startups in Europe don't use any kind of AI technology. It's not even clear whether you use computer programs, that's a different story. <laughs> but certainly they don't seem to be using AI technology. It's important for you to say that you're doing AI because that's how you get your venture capital funding, right? Um, so much of this, of course, is capitalized by and focused on the success in perceptual intelligence. Anecdotal evidence suggests that there is even a push to convert all problems to pure data-driven learning problems just because you know, you can download the TensorFlow and then try to somehow see if you can train something, okay? So there's always been this issue of from data, you want to get knowledge, you know, the whole data science has been trying to get 
insights from data, but there's also examples of people taking explicit knowledge, converting it to data, just so that they can use neural networks. I have heard both companies as well as federal, uh, uh, federal uh, services, like two weeks back I was in an ONR Science of AI uh, workshop, where basically people are being told, please use neural networks somehow, find a way to use deep learning. Otherwise, it's like, you know, your boss won't be happy. And so what do you do? You take what you know and then generate in a whole bunch of examples that respond to your knowledge and then try to deconstruct it back, which is a great academic exercise and improves your funding and uh, both in uh, research and VC funding, but it's not obviously the right direction to go. Um, for a lot of industrial problems, they, we do have standard operating procedures, you know. I mean, we do, as I said, we have both explicit knowledge and tacit knowledge, and we are able to combine these, and sometimes this knowledge is actually easily available, and you want to have a way of combining them. Um, so this, I want to spend this time and say that this data versus doctrine tension is something that is something that we have to keep in mind, um, both in general and as well for this meeting. Um, so Polanyi, who I mentioned last time, is this amateur, uh, philosopher and polymath, and he wrote this book called The Tacit Dimension. And what he said there essentially is that we know more than we can tell, and he was bemoaning the fact that human civilization tended to focus on things that they can write down explicitly, rather than the things that they know but don't know how to write down explicitly, such as the perceptual intelligence. And he was bemoaning that, but now what actually happened is we have gone to the other extreme, which is in fact, we are going through a Polanyi's revenge phase where much of the recent progress has really been on tacit knowledge. And it's sort of, there is also some people at least, some, some uh, interest in trying to see if everything can be learned tacitly without ever being told. Um, recent advances in AI kind of made AI synonymous with learning from massive amounts of data. That's very much a part of the overall enterprise, but that's not the only part um, in terms of intelligent agency. Um, so there, I, there's this fun thing that I saw somebody who tried to learn how to play Sudoku by database learning. So they took the rules of Sudoku, converted into a huge number of solved Sudoku puzzles and tried to reconstruct this. For what reason? This is not the way you would actually try to solve Sudoku if you have any sense. Um, so what do we do when we actually have doctrine that we want the systems to follow? It doesn't make any sense to convert it into these examples. And as I said, one of the hallmarks of human intelligence is the seamless interplay of tacit and explicit knowledge. Okay, and so, but you know, to, in in some technical uh, ways, AI pendulum has swung from all models are wrong, some are useful. To what do you mean models? Just give me data. I mean, everybody would say data is the new aisle, and so somehow you convert everything into data so that you can train the perceptual system, which is hopefully. Uh, that distinction is clear to you. Um, so Polanyi's revenge actually also has uh, a connection to the whole interpretability part, book, which you keep hearing about with respect to AI. You know, I'm sure some of you heard that AI is not explainable. Oh my God, AI does stuff that I don't understand. Well, AI systems, which are based on explicit knowledge supplied by you are very much understandable. AI systems that learn tacit knowledge that you don't know yourself are clearly not understandable because in fact, we can't explain decisions based on tacit knowledge. I can't explain why I think that is Fred. I can't explain why I think this is the leap. There is basically, I just know. And at most I can point saying, look, 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 you know, this guy does have a nose, this guy does have glasses. These are all partial, you know, flailing explanations. These are not really, we cannot actually do uh, proper explanations. So again, this sort of one interesting part to understand is the perceptual reasoning systems have to learn their own representations because they didn't know what our representations are. And when we don't share representations, we can't have explanations. And this does not surprise me. Okay, so in fact, I tend to think of this uh, Wittgenstein quote that even if a lion could speak, we could not understand him. Because it's not just English, it's the shared uh, uh, vocabulary that winds up being important. So, to keep this in perspective, I basically think of the following serenity prayer for the robots, um, which I basically reads, human grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot learn, and data to learn the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. That's important, okay? So it's a kind of a useful 
thing to keep in mind so that you don't basically convert everything into data. Um, the other um, thresholds that, you know, the one that everybody hears about is common sense. And my, everybody has a favorite example of what common sense is. My favorite example is this Magellan example, uh, and it's a nice small quiz uh, at 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, Explorer Magellan went around the world three times. Okay? One of the trips he died. <laughs> you guys have, uh, I know, said this, like, he died. Okay? The question which trip did he die in? That's common sense. Okay? In general, this sort of this glue that combines together all our little bits of knowledge of the world is basically common sense. There are varieties of common sense. And we are doing a better job nowadays than before. But in general, common sense is still an open question. But yeah. Um, the other thing is uh, that that's kind of closer to my heart um, is human AI interaction. We are developing AI technology. Why should we develop AI technology such that we don't have a place in the world that we are creating? It makes no sense whatsoever. So we want AI systems to work with us, and working with us requires these systems to have a theory of mind. They should be able to recognize our intentions. And they should be able to project their own intentions. Um, and this having theory of mind is actually a later development in cognition. And you, there is this beautiful thing called the Sally and test that basically shows that little kids don't realize that what they know is not already known to everybody else. And because of which they can't lie. Because what's the point in lying if everybody knows exactly what you know? And so I actually, as an AI guy, felt extremely happy when my son was able to tell his first lie. Because I knew he has a working brain. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So there's the intention projection. And then Other thing is teaming not only requires well, the AI systems to have a theory of mind of the uh, human, but you, they also need to have a sense of what the human's model is of their capabilities. In general, this second level is what winds up be you know important. What, what winds up being important in showing comprehensible and explicable behavior. If I start doing something like jumping up and down right now. The reason I think you might be surprised are actually if I start hovering on the table. The reason I think you would be surprised about it is because you don't know that I know how to hover. At which point of time, essentially, I might have to do behavior that is consistent, not just with my model, but what I think is your model of my capabilities. And this is something that's being very important, and so that also uh, becomes useful thing. Um, in fact, last year, as uh, the president of AAAI, I get to uh, uh, get the bully pulpit. And so I gave this talk on challenges of human aware AI systems that's available on YouTube on this particular part. Uh, and, and you're welcome to it. So that's the second part. It's done. And the third part is implications of AI for cybersecurity. And as I said, AI techniques can help cybersecurity. Here I'll do some quick, uh, very partial um, 
review of some of the things, but there's a lot more that are going to come because of the very uh, interesting people that we have in the room. And then we'll also talk about an uh, entire uh, new set of uh, um, attack surfaces that AI will open up and then what to do with this in this brave new world, which also we'll be talking about again in the panel on deep phase. Um, okay, so AI can help with cybersecurity. AI can help with everything. So it can also help with cybersecurity. Here are three things that we wrote down. I wrote down, um, actually, Shailik, who is a student of mine, wrote down. Um, so game theoretic models are used a lot um, in, in, um, in basically deciding how to change the configurations of the system such that the attacker will have less of a um, chance of attacking the system. Um, we can use planning reasoning methods to, do, to consider things like the kinds of attacks that are possible that you haven't seen before. This is sort of like verification, except in reverse. Is there a way of showing that the system can be broken using the model that you have of the system? You can also use uh, machine learning techniques to, for example, learn the kinds of things particular kinds of malware uh, might be able to do. Now, I noticed that I wrote machine learning only as the third bullet. I know that the moment I start talking, most of our discussion will just be, how do we use machine learning to stop problems of cybersecurity? I want you to think that AI is essentially combining all these uh, pieces. It's very important, you know, and in fact, there's very mature work in all these directions. Uh, there are people doing this work in this room um, that, that actually that have been uh, listening to. Um, so the, some of the things that we have been looking at in, in our own group, just because I get to be standing here, is for example, how to use the same model uh, to essentially develop behavior that is legible to one agent while obfuscatory to the other agent. So you're essentially trying to control the observability such that your friends know what you're doing, but your enemies will be confused. Okay, there's a paper on triple I, triple I about that. Um, another thing that actually we spent some time on, uh, essentially in terms of game theoretic techniques, is this moving target defense. Uh, this is your box are trying to move so that you can't land a uh, punch on him. Um, so the question, of course, is can you change the configuration, yeah, configurations in some mixed strategies such that the chance of hitting the system are reduced? Okay. Uh, so here is actually, these are all, by the way, this one is uh, work by Shaili, who um, I dragged here uh, so that you can ask more questions. Um, so this is um, moving target defense for web applications. So you keep changing the web configurations such that the ability of the attacker to bring down the system is reduced. So, and uh, it turns out that, you know, if you use game theoretic techniques like Stack Overflow, etc., you wind up doing better than just doing uniform random change of the configurations. Uh, this should not come any as a surprise to people who have background in game theory, but this is something that is very useful uh, in, in cybersecurity applications. Um, this one is a different version where you are putting uh, intrusion detection systems on the network and again you can essentially change the placements um, in, in a randomized way such that you can get um, better uh, robustness for this. Um, there are, you know, these are all graphs that show uh, things work and then there's a nice um, a survey uh, on the moving target defense systems that uh, Shailik did that I'm just going to show that you know, if you can see your fit name somewhere there, you are happy. Um, but there's a, a survey of the moving target defense sy systems that have been used in AI. Now, the last thing that I want to do is widespread use of AI systems opens up new attack surfaces. And of course, cybersecurity techniques can help there and AI techniques can help there too. Um, so, despite what I might have come across as, in case I didn't come across as a RARA cheerleader for AI, here is my RARA cheerleading for AI. AI technology will have many profoundly positive impacts. Do you see the blue skies? Do you see the water? Um, <laughs> quality of life, universal access, social good, intelligent augmentation, lots and lots of great things will happen because of AI. We won't be here. They're not, you know, advantages. And then, if perception they say perception is reality. We have figured out how to do perceptual intelligence. So perception can be used for fake reality. 
Okay, perception is reality, then perception is fake reality. Um, I don't know those of you who are old enough to have seen Moonlighting, which is an old TV show. Uh, magician tells Maddie, people would be much harder to fool if only they didn't have eyes to be sure with. Somehow we believe that if I see it, it must be true. Now with the fake technology, the fake reality technology, you cannot be true. At, you cannot be sure at all that what you're seeing is actually what you see. Um, and so, of course, you know about you can generate fake environments. You can generate uh, uh, people saying you know you can make Obama <laughs> say um, make America great again. You can make uh, Trump say whatever. Uh, all these things can be done with AI technology now. Uh, fake people, fake environment, fake actions, fake narratives. All of this can be done. Um, so this sort of, you know, the, some of the attack surfaces, this is, by the way, I hope you see this um, joy of tech that um, um, uh, thing of internet of uh, things, ransomware, where every one of these is actually <laughs> asking for a ransom. But anyway, you have voice spoofing, you have image spoofing, you have identity spoofing, all of these are now possible. In fact, I tend to think of this as uh, Charlie Chaplin, at one point of time, took part in a Charlie Chaplin lookalike contest. And depending on who you listen to, either he came second or 20th. Okay, in future, we'll all be Charlie Chaplin's. We will be perpetually coming second or 14th to our own selves because the AI will do you better than you yourself. And that could be a worry. Um, so in fact, um, this, as you know, this is the real fake news that's being done in China, which is a, an actual uh, simulated anchor uh, doing the news every day. You heard about that. Um, um, here is another example of whichfaceisreal.com, which is basically they took the same thing that I showed you earlier about this person doesn't exist and they paid it with one picture that is actually a real picture of a real person, another picture that AI dreamed up. Now the question is which one? And you can play this game, you know, if things get, you know, uh, boring here, play this game and then whoever gets higher points can do well. Uh, you know, I mean, I can tell you later on as to which one in this particular case. And in this case, I actually won. I did know which one is it, but you know, it's not obvious. You know, clearly they think look very uh, uh, realistic, and then one of them is actually fake. Now, if this sort of a thing happens, things can be problematic because you don't know who is a real person and who is not a real person. Um, so, the actually the people who did this actually point out. That for now, because of the problems of AI technology, you can still tell that because of the limitations of AI technology, you can still tell in some cases which is real and which is not real. So, for example, they tend to have some kinds of water splotches. Um, if it's a fake image, which is a GAN generated image, you can tend to have back background problems because background gets messed up oftentimes. You can have eyeglass <coughs> problems, there could be asymmetry. For the longest time, I always used to tell my students that AI is the only technology where our failures are just as useful to you as our successes. Mm -hmm. The fact that AI could not read those um, those things that Google will give the you know the, the the checks are you a robot checks is what actually was being used. Uh, except that's a moving target now. In fact, AI can read. AI can recognize images, and so we have to come up with newer and newer techniques to figure out who is human and who is not. This is the same issue. There is a moving target here. As the AI, te the GAN technology becomes better, we no longer know which is real, which is imaginary. Uh, it's harder now. This can. Some of you are in Tinder. I hope. Uh, you really have major worries on the Tinder, right? You know, like you are trying to kind of date this person. And then you show up and there's no person. This could be a big problem, right? Um, thankfully, right now, the AI technology is still leaving. The limitations of AI technology is still keeping your Tinder dating game uh, on point because it turns out the GAMs are not able to generate the same picture more than once because it's a huge distribution from which you're trying to point, you know, pick the points. And it's not easy as of now to generate uh, faces from a different pose. So as they say, you know, if you're trying to date somebody on Tinder, ask them more than three pictures, you know, <laughs> from different, different angles. And then you are, as far as the AI is concerned, you're in bad shape. But then if the AI technology improves, you're in bad shape again. Um, 
This one is the GPT-2. Now, of course, our kids no longer have to take any GREs and SATs. They can, you know, fire up GPT-2 on their, uh, you know, cell phone, and then the and the, it will generate all these great essays. So the question, of course, is how do you decide which is the real essay or the imagined essay? Again, currently the failure, the current limitations can be used to tell apart. For example, there is a tool called Litter.io that just came out today, uh, this week, uh, last week, which basically says that if you are too predictable, because essentially what they're doing is they're learning these massive language models, and uh, based on that this current word, then you get to generate the next word. And if the words in, in an actual uh, story are very likely because of the <coughs> language model, then probably it was machine generated. Okay, so not surprisingly, scientific abstracts, that's the last thing that we'll still be able to fool the machines, I guess. Scientific abstracts, essentially. So the ones that are green, those are all essentially highly predictive, te predictable test, uh, text from the, from the um, language model. And so this is sort of potentially more machine generated. This is no machine will generate this yet, apparently. Uh, again, this is to a moving target because we can get better at it and it will become harder to predict this. In fact, what this really is, if you don't want to be mistaken for, uh, for a machine, say something completely unexpected, right? Like nobody expects Spanish Inquisition, as you know. Uh, and so that's pretty much the only way we can do right now. Um, so AI can also help in this case with the new attack surfaces it opens. Uh, there's some work that we have done, the other people have done too, but the work that we have done basically shows that if you play between different network configurations, then if there is a differential immunity between those <coughs> network configurations, which there tends to be, you can use that to do better than any one, essentially the ensemble-based uh, moving target defense. Uh, that actually is like some of the, one of the ideas that we played with. And it turns out that is reasonably robust, even if in fact you actually train the networks uh, adversarially to begin with. Okay, so this is kind of a reasonable idea, but there are many other ideas that are trying. Uh, back several years back, I think two years back, Kathleen and I were in this ASU Origins workshop, which said the AI adversarial outcomes, uh, envisioning adverse outcomes of AI and thinking about what to do with it. And this was like a real paranoid conference where we were thinking about all the crazy things that AI can do and what hope is there for us. And so these are this beautiful uh, set of uh, panels that we had. And um, in fact, that's something that we're doing with respect to that, a subset of that with respect to cybersecurity, except some years down the day. Um, so there was you know, this, this uh, thing about AI scientists gathered to plot doomsday scenarios and the solutions. You know, AI is sort of a double-edged sword and you can use it both ways. Um, there is also, um, Around that same time, uh, Miles Brandage actually, who was at, work at that workshop, also ran a separate workshop and then ran and actually detailed down the report from that uh, called the malicious use of AI, which is available at this maliciousairreport.com, and it's a useful thing to see. Okay, two minutes summary. So, having made progress on declarative tasks, AI systems have recently found significant success in learning tacit knowledge from data. I hope that you got that. And this has had some interesting ramifications both within and outside the field. There is this issue that whatever, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail phenomenon. And it's important to keep that in mind. Uh, we are still far from general intelligence. Significant thresholds remain to be crossed, um, uh, as I mentioned. And then of course, AI <laughs> remains a potent, potent tool as well as a weapon. Across the board, there's this old, uh, this nice song by Andy DeFranco, uh, it says, every tool is a weapon if used right. And AI is the ultimate tool. So you can use it both as a tool or a weapon. And uh, so it, it is, and that's just true also for cyber security. And that's something that we can keep in mind. And then finally, Pandora's box. Everybody will say, why did Pandora open the box? Why did we get into this mess where we started actually figuring out how, you know, perceptive intelligence is done or how intelligence, you know, can be automated. And now the box is open. That's why we are here to figure out what to do. But I want to end with a, a, a like a, a, a hopeful note. Um, if you read the full story of Pandora's box, everybody knows Pandora opened the box. After that, they don't know what the heck happened. Um, <laughs> Pandora finds at the end, after all the demons escape, 
there is hope inside the box. And that could be the hope that we will be bringing. Thank you for your time. Okay, I, I, I would like to um, exercise the chair's prerogative and ask one question, <laughs> and then we'll, we'll, we'll break for a couple minutes. So, uh, about 35 years ago, when students studied AI, they learned about neural assignment and predicate calculus, physical simple systems, etc. cetera. Um, 25 years ago, students learned about expert systems and all of the sort of um, gold rush surrounding that. Today, students are learning machine learning and Python and all, all the things that we're, we're aware of now, which is, which is the language today. What will students be studying 10 years from now, 15 years from now? A union of all of these plus more. Uh, anybody, I think my, my hope is actually uh, for you to, to get across the point, science is a human endeavor. Okay, I mean, it's, it's, you know, we are National Academies of Science, but science is a human endeavor, and it is filled with all the biases that we humans have. At one point of time, there'll be in technology, all of us will jump on it, and then it'll be out, and then we'll move on to something else. But the essential nature of the problems, and, and the fact that we write down our progress, make, keeps the hope alive that actually ideas that we thought weren't working and threw it away will come back. That's what happened in neural networks. And that can actually very much happen to these issues of representations of explicit knowledge, which is where uh, both logic and uh, probabilistic um, reasoning systems have been used. Okay, So this, this issue of the symbol system hypothesis, um, which was sort of the Newell Simons thing, versus Jeff Hinton's uh, bravado saying that symbols are but the ether of artificial intelligence, um, just like the physics ether, don't, they don't have to exist. Those are the two extremes. Really, we do need symbols, especially if the AI systems are working with us because we need to have common vocabularies. So they'll wind up having these connections. Okay, so just a quick follow-up. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm recalling back in 86, the Hinton, McClellan, and Romahart paper, um, machine learning and artificial neural networks were largely a backwater. Is there, is there the equivalent of a backwater today that we'll see 20 years from now? That I, think, yeah, I think the definition of backwaters is that nobody knows that they're backwaters. <laughs> they basically think <laughs> we are smart enough to avoid this stupid idea and there will be some irrational people who hang around and then they might win. Okay, So there are a whole bunch of, take all of AI, so if you come to AAA, you know, Currently, about 65 to 70 percent of the papers are on perceptual intelligence using deep learning. That still leaves a whole entire 30 percent. All those ideas, essentially, are not getting as much, um, you know, push as need now from you know currently because of the fashion. But that would actually those are all candidates for potentially coming back. Plus ideas that we haven't yet thought about. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so let's take a 10-minute break, and we'll come back for uh, panel number one. Thank you.